The Citrus Bowl, Orlando, Florida, was the site of the opening round of the 1992 AMA Camel Supercross Series. For several riders, like defending champion Jean-Michel Bale from France and his Honda teammate, two-time former champion Jeff Stanton from Sherwood, Michigan, expectations were high. In the Yamaha camp, hopes rode on the shoulders of 19-year-old Damon Bradshaw. Another two-time champion, Kawasaki Jeff Ward, had announced this was his last year. His preseason intentions? Shoot for the top. Teammates Mike Kudrowski and newly signed Mike LaRocco, along with amending Jeff Matasevich, were expected to make waves. Suzuki's veteran, Guy Cooper, had never won a Supercross main event. At 30 years of age, time was running out. Cooper knows he has what it takes. There were, of course, other stars, as well as a multitude of tough privateers set to challenge the preseason favorites. Their goals and dreams were all the same, as well as the route they would travel to achieve them. Ride the ragged edge, and sometimes beyond. Whoever rode the edge the best, and the most consistent, would be in line for the most coveted number one plate in the world of off-road motorcycle racing. With it would come fame and riches, prize money, salaries, bonuses, contingencies, and bargaining power. All told, the value of the crown, over $1 million. With that in mind, the gate dropped at the season opener in Orlando, Florida, and the quest for Supercross supremacy was underway. When the field emerged from the first corner, the youngest member of Team Yamaha, Jeff Emig from Highland, California, was in the lead. Close behind, number nine, Jeff Matasevich, number 10, Larry Ward, and Steve Lampson, number 16. The big guns, Damon Bradshaw, Jeff Stanton, and Jean-Michel Bale were back in the pack, clawing for survival. In the early going, the field sorted themselves out. Emig began to stretch his lead, while behind him, the action was fast and furious. Mike LaRocco, rider number seven, was the first rider to show signs of taking charge. LaRocco blew past Steve Lampson to take over fourth. Next on LaRocco's hit list, Larry Ward. LaRocco stalked the Suzuki rider. When the time was right, made the pass and settled into third. LaRocco's teammate, Mike Kidrowski, rider number three, was in danger of being left behind. The situation called for a desperation pass, and Kidrowski, with a bump and run move, was up to the task. Up front, Emig continued to lead and appeared to grow stronger with each passing lap. Matasevich, however, in second place, was running out of steam. A severely broken leg at the tail end of the 1991 season caused Matasevich to miss several months of riding and conditioning. At about the midway mark of the 20-lap main event, it began to show. In a rough set of whoops, LaRocco went to the inside, but Tasevich was dropped to third. A few corners later, it was Kidrowski's turn. Matasevich drifted to the outside, and Kidrowski was quick to pounce. In the meantime, Jeff Stanton had been riding the wheels off his Honda. From out of the pack, he caught Matasevich, made a mid-air correction, and he too made the pass. With Emming up front, LaRocco in second, Kidrowski third, and Stanton fourth, the stage was set for the closing laps. Of the four riders, Stanton appeared to be the fastest, having come from off the pace to catch the leaders, and certainly he was the most aggressive. Watch the near disastrous move coming up. Stanton scattered hay all over the track, then nearly scattered himself and Kidrowski. From that point, the action was virtually nonstop. Stanton kept the pressure on Kidrowski, who picked up the pace and closed on LaRocco. In turn, LaRocco caught Emig. The chase was on and the pressure intense. Emig was the first to crack. Watch the bobble in the middle of the corner. Just like that, LaRocco took over the point position. From his vantage point, Stanton saw it all. He knew LaRocco would put distance between himself and the rest of the field. He knew that to keep his hopes for a win alive, he needed to stay with Mike LaRocco. In a sweeping sand-filled corner, Stanton grabbed a handful of throttle. Out of the corner, he carried his momentum into a rough set of whoops and drew alongside Kidrowski. Watch what happens. Kidrowski nailed Jeff Emig. Neither rider was injured, but both were out of the hunt. Let's take another look. At the tail end of the whoop section, Emig bobbles big time. Kidrowski running wide open had nowhere to go. The four rider battle was down to two. LaRocco with a lead, Stanton second, and time was running out. Stanton got as close to LaRocco as he could, hoping to force a mistake. When LaRocco refused to cooperate, Stanton decided to force the issue. LaRocco was up to the task and rejected the aggressive move. Stanton had to fall back to regroup. Final lap, 
The Rocco had fought off every Stanton charge. The crowd sensed there was one more in the making. In the roughest set of whoops, Stanton turned the throttle to the lock. He paid the price. The two-time champion was quickly up, but the damage was done. At the checkered flag, LaRocco recorded the second Supercross win of his career. Jeff Ward finished second, while Stanton picked himself up to finish third. Almost overlooked was a fourth-place finish for Damon Bradshaw, who, after crashing in the early going, spent the entire main event playing catch-up. Doug Dubach rounded out the top five. Jean-Michel Bale finished sixth. The 1992 AMA Camel Supercross season was underway. The next stop? The Astrodome in Houston, Texas. On hand was the Isuzu Cycle Cam to record the treacherous Houston track. This is from a rider's point of view. Let's take a roller coaster ride. Makes me dizzy just to watch. Main event time and 20 of the best Supercross riders in the world are set to go. Keep your eye on both ends of the pack as they round the first corner. For at least two riders, it's the story of the race. Damon Bradshaw out front, dead last, defending champ, Jean-Michel Bale. For the second week in a row, Jeff Matasevich was strong in the early laps. The Team Kawasaki rider followed a pattern that would become a familiar one as the season progressed. Strong starts, then a gradual fade out of contention as his lack of training due to his 1991 leg injury took its toll. The early laps also saw a great battle between Kawasaki teammates Mike Kudrowski and Jeff Ward. That battle ended when the duo got together in a tight hairpin turn to compare notes. While they struggled to untangle themselves, the field behind them took advantage to become the field in front of them. As the Coors Light Challenge Round 2 of the Camel Supercross Series wore on, the attention of the crowd was on three riders. Damon Bradshaw, who out front was riding a controlled, air-free race. Jean-Michel Bale, who was all the way up to fifth from dead last and camped on the rear wheel of Guy Cooper. And Cooper himself, who was just about to zap Stefan Everts in typical Cooper fashion, in the air. Coming up, another Cooper pass at the Astrodome. Number nine, Matasevic, the victim. Now you know why Cooper's nickname is Airtime. At that point, the front-running positions were secure. Bradshaw took the win, the ninth of his career, and the first of the young Supercross season. Cooper finished second, while Bale turned in an outstanding ride to take third. Stanton and LaRocco rounded out the top five. Bradshaw's win elevated the Yamaha star to the top of the Camel Supercross standings. It was on to Anaheim, California. There, Damon Bradshaw talked about his strategy for the season. You know, I've set the strategy for every race this year. I'm going to ride every race like I'm last in points. And uh, I'm going to still be smart, but I'm going to do everything I can to to win. We'll get to the Anaheim main event shortly to see if Bradshaw's strategy will work two weeks in a row. But first, let's check the action from heat race number one. It was provided by Guy Cooper on the yellow bike and Mike Chamberlain on the green machine. Watch the upcoming crash. Now that was a block pass and a half. Not to worry, both riders survived with minor bruises. Second heat, another block pass attempt coming up. Matasevich the blocker, Bale the block E. That, folks, is how not to do it. On to the main event where, for the second week in a row, Bradshaw's strategy was spot on. The teenager from Mooresville, North Carolina, took the lead on the second lap and was never headed. In fact, by the midway point of the main event, the first five positions were secure. Bale was in the runner-up spot about three seconds back. Stanton was third, seven and a half seconds off the pace, being pushed by Cooper. Kidrowski in fifth was well behind the leaders. They stayed that way to the checkered flag. Afterward, Bradshaw reflected on the win. Damon Bradshaw, you're on a roll. Last week, uh, the qualifier tonight, you were a little modest before the main event tonight. I don't think you needed to be. You were in full control. No, I got off to a good start, like I said, and uh, you know that's what I wanted to do. I had to work hard. This was a tough track. Um, I charged maybe two or three corners. You know, Each lap, I didn't charge the whole race to save a little energy because I figured he's going to pour it on there. At the end, and he did, and I was able to hold on to it. With the skyline of Seattle, Washington, and the Puget Sound as backdrops, the series moved to the kingdom, where the question was, how do you stop Damon Bradshaw? It was not so much that he had won two in a row, but how he had won them, that being virtually uncontested. The powerful Honda team had yet to win a race and were searching for answers. They did not find them in Seattle. 
Bradshaw, on a roll, took the early lead and turned in another stellar performance. In the early going, Bradshaw's Yamaha teammate, Jeff Emmy gave chase, as did the veteran Guy Cooper. Right behind them, Stanton and Bale. They had started mid-pack. The Team Honda riders were again caught playing the now familiar game of catch me if you can. In the minds of most self-proclaimed experts, if anyone were to catch Bradshaw, it would have to be Stanton or Bale. Kidrowski and Larocco were fast but inconsistent. Matasevich not physically able to go flat out for a full 20 laps. Jeff Emig lacked the experience to keep pace for a full season. Guy Cooper's wide open style led to mistakes. Jeff Ward in his final season was not the Jeff Ward of old. The process of elimination left only Stanton and Bale. On the fourth lap at Seattle, Stanton took control of second place. It was too late. Bradshaw had established a comfortable lead and was just as fast as Stanton. Unless Bradshaw faltered, there was no way Stanton would catch up. From mid-pack, Bale's situation was even more hopeless. To catch the leaders was to let it all hang out and go for broke. That's what he did. He caught Emig, who was in fourth place. The pass attempt, though, ended with an uncharacteristic Bale crash. The defending champ was quick to rejoin the fray, but valuable seconds were lost in the process. Valuable seconds that allowed Bradshaw to increase his lead. Bale again caught Emig. This time, there were no mistakes, and the pass was made. On the next lap, Bale passed Cooper to take over third. Stanton, though, in second place, was too far ahead to catch. Bradshaw, in turn, was out of sight. At the checkered flag, it was three in a row for the 19-year-old star. Three more points added to his series lead and the 11th Supercross win of his career. The season had a faint odor of a rout. Series moved on. The most common complaint among those that were not winning was the tracks were too easy. Give us a tough track and we'll strut our stuff, they said. At San Diego's Jack Murphy Stadium, they got their wish. Heat number one, check it out. Jean-Michel Bale, the best mogul rider in the world, meets the most vicious moguls in the world. The moguls win. Mike LaRocco, same moguls, same result. Now watch the right side of your screen as Jimmy Button takes a turn. Mickey Diamond was an innocent bystander but was caught up in Button's crash. Keep your eye on the extreme right of the screen again. The track claimed another victim in Jeff Emig. Tough track, you bet it was, but it made no difference. The start was controlled by a trio of Kawasaki's. Mike Kudrowski led the way, followed by Jeff Ward and Jeff Matasevich. Bradshaw was in fourth, but not for long. Before the first lap had ended, Bradshaw was in second and stalking Mike Kudrowski. It was apparent the two riders on this day, at least, were the class of the field. They chose the right lines, set a blistering pace that left all others behind. For Bradshaw, though, that was not good enough. On the fourth lap, Bradshaw made the pass, and was back into familiar territory. Meanwhile, a battle was raging for third. Jeff Ward had it. Matasevich, Stanton, and Bale wanted it. Matasevich made the bid and the pass, but watch this. Boom! Ward runs into the back of Matasevich. Stanton goes to the outside, and they're three wide through the whoops. Stanton found daylight between the Kawasaki teammates, and he moved to third. Bale followed suit and eventually moved to fourth. By the checkered flag, Bale and Stanton had flip-flopped to finish third and fourth behind Kudrowski and a long-gone Damon Bradshaw. The route remained unchecked. Bradshaw's streak was at four, his series point lead up to 20. You know, I'm getting those good starts that I need. This Team Yamaha is working really good. This bike's working good. Me and my mechanic and the whole team are working really good together, so we got a good package going. They didn't make it as easy on you tonight. You had to come from fourth. Was that any trouble? Uh, I mean, I had to work, you know, it wasn't easy, you know, it took me a little bit to get by Mike, the track was, you know, a little difficult to pass on, but, uh, you know, they tried to make it a little more tougher on me this week, but I think it just made it, you know, maybe a little more even for the guys. In Atlanta, Georgia, the following week, frustrations began to surface. Teammates that normally cut each other some slack were taking no prisoners. In the opening heat, Kudrowski paid the price when he rushed a pass on Jeff Ward. Same heat race, check the action between Stanton and Bale. After battling most of the race, there were just a couple of corners to go. Bale was determined to pass, regardless of the consequences, and Stanton was equally determined the pass would not be made. Watch the contact. It was that kind of aggressive riding that was beginning to surface. The pressure was catching up, and it was not just in the camps of those doing the chasing. Bradshaw was feeling it, too. 
In the second heat race of the night, the series leader was up against an old arch rival, Jeff Matasevich. Now, if that was not enough, Bradshaw had earlier complained the entire Kawasaki team was dogging him in practice. If he slowed down to let one of them by, another one would take his place. High pressure tactics? You bet. Supercross is a high pressure game. Was it working? You be the judge. Watch this pass attempt on Jeff Matasevich. In slow motion, it appears it was Bradshaw's fault. Bradshaw did not agree. After the race, Bradshaw followed Matasevich off the track. He parked his Yamaha in front of Matasevich, jumped off, and began shouting at the Kawasaki rider. Bradshaw would later claim Matasevich had intentionally slowed to cause the conflict. And what did Matasevich say to that? No, you know, I, he hit my rear uh, tire. You know, it's pretty much his fault. And uh, I guess since he's, lead, think he's leading the championship point standings, uh, he thinks everyone should get out of his way. But, you know, I know, you know this Kawasaki rider ain't going to budge just because he's leading the series. Main event, and for the first time in the season, Jean-Michel Bale was out front. Bradshaw was back in fifth. Between him and Bale, Jeff Matasevich, Jeff Ward, and Larry Ward. It was Bale's turn to open a lead while Bradshaw struggled in traffic. But Bradshaw had no intention of letting Bale get away. In the space of a couple of corners, Bradshaw went from fifth to second. Larry Ward went wide in the second corner and was easy pickings. The next two passes theoretically should have been tougher. But they weren't. Bradshaw blew by both Ward and Matasevich and set his sights on Bale. On Mechanics Row, Bradshaw's tuner, Brian Lunas, was calm and confident. He could smell five in a row, and it was just one pass away. Now watch what happens. Jean-Michel Bale slows the pace, changes lines, stands on the pegs, and apparently lets Bradshaw make the pass. Bale later said he was uncomfortable and wanted to study Bradshaw's lines. Bradshaw said, thank you very much. The next time through the Mechanics area, Lunas gave the universal think sign to his rider. His riders said, think? I think I'll blow this field away. The race was as good as over. Bradshaw made it five in a row, followed by Bale, LaRocco, Kidrowski, and Stanton in that order. After six events, Bradshaw led the series by 24 points over Bale, 29 over Stanton. No one else was in the hunt. For the win at Daytona, Bradshaw would go into the record book alongside the two winningest riders in the history of Supercross, Rick Johnson and Bob Hurricane Hanna the only riders to have ever won six in a row. But at Daytona, Bradshaw's string ran out. Jeff Stanton took the win with Bradshaw second. Bale was third, LaRocco fourth, and Mike Kidrowski was fifth. At round eight of the series, Bradshaw's interrupted win streak did nothing to quell the admiration of the capacity crowd. Bradshaw was in his own backyard. He was born and raised just a few blocks from Charlotte Memorial Stadium, Charlotte, North Carolina. The series points leader was in the spotlight and deservedly so. A quick trip through the crowd confirmed the near unanimous choice for the checkered flag. Bradshaw! David Bradshaw! David, David Bradshaw. Bradshaw! Who do you cheer for? Tim Bradshaw. Perhaps it was the pressure of the hometown crowd that got to Bradshaw, or maybe he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. In any event, somewhere on the opening lap of the main event, Bradshaw disappeared. When the hometown favorite resurfaced, he was at the tail end of the pack. Out front, it was a trio of Jeffs. Ward, Matasevich, and Stanton in that order. Larry Ward was fourth, Doug Dubach fifth, Jean-Michel Bale was in ninth. It was tailor-made for Stanton. Jeff Ward had been riding hurt for several races. There was no doubt he would fall from the pace. Matasevich, although stronger than in the early season, still not able to go a full 20 laps wide open. It was Jeff Stanton's race all the way. All Stanton had to do was take advantage of the situation. Stanton, though, had trouble in the opening laps. He seemed cautious rather than aggressive. Larry Ward passed Stanton to take third. Stanton would pass him back, but the time spent doing that should have been spent charging to the front and opening a gap between himself and the rest of the field. By the time Stanton put it together, there was company in the person of Jean-Michel Bale knocking at the door. Instead of a big lead, he was involved in a three-way battle for survival. Matasevich was out front, blocking every Stanton pass attempt. Bale was a close third and biding his time. Passing on the tight Charlotte track was tough, and Matasevich was hanging tougher. 
It was time to force the issue. In a left-hand hairpin turn, Stanton drove in hard. The block pass worked, but Stanton had lost his momentum, and Bale with the inside line took control of the lead. In the remaining laps, Stanton would give chase, but Bale had the momentum and would make no mistakes. With a battle for the lead decided, the attention of the crowd turned back to Bradshaw. With this pass on Jeff Ward, the crowd favorite moved into sixth. The last couple of laps were spent trying to run Cooper down, who was in fifth, but at the checkered flag, Bradshaw's bid came up short. For the second week in a row, a Honda had won the main event. Stanton was second. Larry Ward turned in his best ride of the season to finish third. The difference between first and sixth place points, 10. In a single race, Bradshaw's series lead had gone from 26 to 16. The route was temporarily halted. The next stop on the Supercross Tour was at the Hoosier Dome in Indianapolis, Indiana. The action started in the heats and was virtually nonstop until the final checkered flag of the night. In the opening heat, the two Honda riders, perhaps buoyed by consecutive Honda wins, seemed to ride with confidence and authority that had not been present in early season races. Bale was the winner, and in the post-race interview, that newly found confidence was even more pronounced. I think so, you know, if I have a good start, I think I can win the race, and I feel very good, and the track is very nice, so I, I feel very good today. Bradshaw was in the second heat. In the early going, he trailed the Kawasaki's of Mike LaRocco and Mike Kidrowski. Coming up, a LaRocco move that will put the Indiana native into first and will lead to a major crash. Off the finish line jump, Bradshaw landed on Kidrowski. Kidrowski suffered no ill effects, but his bike was tangled with Bradshaw's. Bradshaw was shaken and limped to the side of the track. Tell us a little bit about it. We couldn't see it all. Yeah, well, um, Mike LaRocco was coming up behind me, and he passed me just before the finish line jump. And I kind of dove underneath him when we went up the finish line jump. He kind of cut over on me a little bit. And when we took off, I didn't want to clip his back wheel in the air, so I kind of let off a little. And when I was landing on the, the finish line jump, Bradshaw flew and landed right on the back of me. And uh, his bike kind of, I don't know, it got caught on mine and ripped his throttle open. And it was wide open, and the bike was spinning around. I was kind of on his bike, and I got a little bit on my, my arm and stuff. But uh, we both ended up not finishing, so it looks like we'll be in the semi. Both riders were okay, but both bikes required major reconstructive surgery. Bradshaw and Kudrowski transferred to the main from the semifinals. When the gate dropped for the main event, the question being asked by the huge crowd on hand for the inaugural Supercross at the Hoosier Dome, how would the crash affect Damon Bradshaw? The answer to that, as the series points leader thundered into the lead, was not at all. Behind Bradshaw, the heavy hitters were all up front. Stanton, third in the series, was in second. Bale, who came into Indianapolis in second place, was running third. In fourth place in the race, Mike Kidrowski. He was fifth in the standings. Mike LaRocco, fourth in the standings, rounded out the top five in the race. It was the start that everyone was looking for. The big guns were head to head. On lap number three, the running order changed. Jeff Stanton passed Bradshaw to take over the point position. With seven rounds remaining after Indianapolis, the three-point difference between first and second was not on the minds of the riders. What was on their minds was the win itself. For Bradshaw, a chance to regain early season dominance. For Stanton or Bale, a huge confidence booster. If there was a game plan, it was shared by all three. Ride smooth, stay out of trouble, stay in the hunt in the early laps, then let it all hang out in the dash with a checkered flag. Behind the lead trio, LaRocco and Kidrowski were having a battle of their own. Until the midway point of the race, Kidrowski was boss. Then LaRocco found a good line and took over fourth. Meanwhile, up front, the complexion of the race for the 1992 Camel Supercross crown was about to change. Watch Bradshaw closely on the upcoming jump. He knows he can't save it, so he jumped off in midair. It looks like the motorcycle landed squarely on top of him. As we look at the crash again, let me tell you, Bradshaw was not seriously injured. He was shaken up, he was battered, bruised a bit, and had the wind knocked out of him. It could have been a lot worse. As soon as he was able, Bradshaw remounted and tried to rejoin the race. He rode about half a lap, and too sore to continue, pulled off the track. The Bradshaw crash was a definite turning point in the series. 
But prior to the incident, the Honda guys were still in the title hunt. Let's listen to Stanton as he heads for the checkered flag. I just need to be real consistent from here on out, stay on top of, uh, on top of that bike, not, not be on the ground, and uh, be beating them consistently, uh, both JMB and uh, Bradshaw. There's, there's more than one person out there. There's more than just them, so. But I feel good. I know I can do it. Stanton and Bale went 1-2 and left Indianapolis tied in series points. Throw away the first nine rounds. With seven to go, it's a whole new series. Here's a look at the championship leaderboard as the Supercross Series heads south to the Sunshine State and Tampa, Florida. Stanton and Bale are on top with 186. Bradshaw, who at one time enjoyed a 26-point lead, is in third. He's four points back. Guy Cooper is on top of the next group of five, followed by Larry Ward, Dubok, Matasevich, and Jeff Emmy. Round 10 of the 16-race series will go down as one of the best Supercross races ever. The fireworks that preceded the Tampa shootout were just a sample of the fireworks to come. Here's the drop of the gate, and you need to watch close. The moves, the passes, the bumps, and the grinds are going to come hot and heavy. It started with a pileup in the first corner that claimed two factory riders, Mike LaRocco and Doug Dubach, and a pair of privateers, Gene Numack and Michael Craig. Jeff Matasevich, as he has done so many times this season, grabbed the whole shot, followed by Mike Kudrowski. Hometown hero Ron Tishner was next, then Jeremy McGrath, and a host of others that included Stanton, Cooper, Bradshaw, and Bale. Now, privateers are not supposed to pass factory riders. No one told that to Tishner, so he took the measure of Kudrowski. Tishner, from nearby Palm Harbor, always rides well in Florida. Tonight, no exception. On the second lap, Tishner drew a bead on Matasevich and, to the delight of the screaming crowd, took over the front-running position. The real excitement, though, was behind the leaders, like this Stanton Bradshaw affair. Now remember that pass, Stanton will, a little bit later, get revenge. Back to the front of the pack where Cooper is about to drop kick Tishner out of the lead. Now that bump and run with a minor pass interference infraction made Cooper the third leader of the night. Back to the dogfight. Stanton is about set to even the score with Bradshaw. Bradshaw runs off the track and jumps a hay bale to get back on. We'll take a look at that one again, as well as the earlier move Bradshaw put on Stanton. Now, there was Bradshaw block passing Stanton. Here's the retaliation move, complete with a little shoulder action. Bradshaw has nowhere to go except off the track. Stanton was the clear-cut winner of that round. A couple of laps later, Bradshaw was in fifth place and looking for a way around Matasevich in fourth. No sweat. Matasevich solved the problem for him. Coming up, a block pass attempt by Bale on Bradshaw that goes nowhere. Did Bradshaw see him coming or what? Meanwhile, at the front of the pack, Stanton had caught Cooper. He's challenging for the lead. Stanton could have delivered a block pass there like the one he handed Bradshaw, but chose to let Cooper off the hook. Could be he knew the upcoming whoops would get the job done. Jeff Stanton is the fourth leader of the night. A few laps later, with Bradshaw in tow and Bale not far behind, Cooper struck back through several corners, a couple of straightaways, and whatever other obstacles presented themselves, Cooper and Stanton rode on the ragged edge side by side. It was Supercross racing at its best. Stanton held the lead that time, but it was far from over. The two-rider spat turned into a three-rider war as Bradshaw jumped in, and if you look real close, you'll catch glimpses of Bale lurking in the background. Three abreast, and Cooper sweeps into the lead one more time. The crowd sensed the battle was not over, and they were right. Stanton was set for another go. Again, the pair of riders battled side by side. Stanton seemed to gain the advantage, but Cooper wrung it out and catapulted his Suzuki high in the air. Stanton missed the long jump. He again dropped back. Meanwhile, for the past several laps, Jean-Michel Bale had been watching the riders in front of him. With time running out, he made his move. Watch Bale on the left side of your screen. He found a fast line through the whoops and took the measure of Bradshaw. He got a great drive out of the hairpin turn, attacked the next set of whoops, and pulled even with Cooper. Bale made the pass. He set his sights on race leader Stanton, who had no idea Bale was on the charge. When they hit the sand pit, they were side by side, but Bale had the good line on the inside, and he made the pass. For the last few laps, Stanton would chase Bale, but to no avail. Third place, it was still up for grabs. 
first there was this little shove as Bradshaw tried to pass Cooper. Then there was this block pass where Bradshaw got the job done. Then there was this Cooper pass and a Bradshaw elbow. Here it is again. Now that'll get you at least 15 yards and an automatic first down in the NFL. At the checkered flag, it was Bale's second win of the season, followed by Stanton, Cooper, and Bradshaw. And what did Bale think about the race? I uh, feel very good tonight. Uh, very nice race. I think it's the best race I ever ever in Europe. And you know, I'm very happy when, when you win like that. It's, you know, it's a lot more beautiful than uh, when you go away alone. So I think it was a nice race for everybody. And, you know, I'm looking forward to see this race on the TV. Well, JMB, if you're watching this on TV, I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Both Bale and Stanton gained points on Bradshaw in the battle for the Supercross crown. But with six events still to go, it was far from over. Pontiac, Michigan, the Silverdome, and in a single weekend, the site of rounds 11 and 12. It was also the site of another dramatic swing in the championship chase. A swing determined by one small section of the Silverdome track, the first corner. The hardest hit in round 11 was Mike Kidrowski. He's rider number three. Watch what happens to motocross Mike in his heat race. The traffic forces Kidrowski to the inside. He runs into a hay bale. Here he is again in a semifinal. Now this time, Kidrowski makes it around the corner. Home free? Not a chance. He's knocked down and is run into by Ray Somo. That means a trip to the last chance qualifier. He won that one going away. Not the gate real good, but I get in the first turn and I end up running into somebody or somebody ran into me in both the heat race and the semi. And and this time I just went out and hole shot at the last chance because that's the last chance I have to get in the main and I can't afford to lose those points. So I went out there and did it and won. Kidrowski's problems though were not over. Here's the start of the main event and another Kidrowski first corner crash. This time he had company. Jean-Michel Bale turned the corner on the inside. He was forced into the hay bales. The series points leader coming into Pontiac would start round 11 at the tail end of the pack. The whole shot belonged to a pair of privateers, Larry Brooks, rider number 30, and Mike Jones, number 38. Now, as you might expect, their moments of glory were short-lived. Bradshaw passed Jones on the opening lap, then turned his attention to Brooks. That pass took a little longer. Brooks held on to the lead until the second lap. Bradshaw picked his spot, then zapped the privateer. Jean-Michel Bale from the back of the pack was passing everyone in sight. He eventually moved to seventh place. Not near good enough to hold the series lead. Guy Cooper, another rider on the move. Here he catches and will pass Larry Brooks for second. Brooks incidentally finished in fifth place, his best ever performance in a Supercross main event. He would be passed one more time by Jeff Stanton, who perhaps was the fastest rider on the track. In front of a partisan crowd, the Michigan rider rolled the wheels off his Honda as he ran down the leaders. From mid-pack, Stanton put on an impressive charge. Once past Brooks, Stanton caught Cooper. The pair of riders dazzled the crowd with an awesome side-by-side -side display of racing. Finally, Stanton did the impossible. He outjumped Guy Cooper to take control of second place. With no one to race with, Cooper found time to relax in a short stretch of Michigan sand. His Suzuki stayed running. He was up in a flash and held on to third. For Bradshaw, it was an easy night as he took his sixth win of the season. Stanton finished second and moved to the top of the series leaderboard. Well, at this point, the points lead doesn't really mean much. Um, I just want to be up there on the podium and be up in 1-2. That's where you get the most points, so I just need to consistently be winning. But I felt real good. I got off to a decent start, and uh, I think some of the other guys got a bad start. But uh, I think they may have had some of the bad luck I've had the couple, last couple weeks. But you know, I was able to win tonight, and uh, tomorrow's a different night. It was a different night, all right, but only for the competition. Here's the start of the main event and the start of more first corner woes. Guy Cooper was a big-time victim, crashing before he even got to the corner. But in typical Cooper fashion, he was up, back in the race, where he eventually finished 12th. The whole shot went to rider number 23, Ron Tishner, aboard a tough racing Suzuki. Right behind came Mike Kidrowski, Damon Bradshaw, Mike LaRocco, Jeff Matasevich, and the rest of the field, including Bale in ninth, and Stanton, a victim of first corner traffic in 16th. Kidrowski, perhaps anxious to make up for the previous night's showing, passed Tishner on the second lap. 
Bradshaw did not want to give Kidrowski the chance to lead the field, so he followed suit and, within a few short yards, was camped on Kidrowski's rear wheel. Meanwhile, Team Honda was on the gas. Jean-Michel passed Larry Brooks to move to seventh, while Stanton, still outside the top ten, was moving up at a torrid pace. By the time Stanton reached the checkered flag, he was up to seventh. Under the circumstances, an outstanding ride, but not good enough to hold the series lead. Back to the front of the pack where Bradshaw was still shadowing Kidrowski. Prior to the race, Bradshaw was asked if he had a strategy for the Pontiac doubleheader. Yeah, I'm going to let it hang on the edge. You know, I'm going to have to do everything it takes to win. You know, there's no, uh, definitely no pads from, no points for me to pad, so I'm going for it. Remember, at one time, Bradshaw had a 26-point lead on the field. He lost it, but was now on the verge of getting it back. Bale, meanwhile, was still picking off riders. With this pass on Jeff Matasevich, Bale moved into fourth. Matasevich would hang on to finish fifth. It was his best finish to date in the season. With five laps to go, it was time for Bradshaw to go to work. He pulled alongside Kudrowski in a rough set of whoops and with a best line coming out, made the pass. Bradshaw was on the way to victory number seven. Time was running out with Jean-Michel Bale too. On the verge of moving up one more notch, he had caught Mike LaRocco, but watch this. Larry Ward stalled his Suzuki. It fired. He pulled into Bale's line. The win, the roses, and the traditional cross-up all belong to Bradshaw. Seven wins in 1992, and more importantly, he was back on top of the title chase. Kidrowski was second, LaRocco third, Bale fourth, and Stanton, he finished seventh. Damon, a super effort. Get off that Yamaha and take a bow. Talk about a happy guy, he had found the combination that carried him to five wins in a row in the early part of the season. Here's a quick look at the series standings. Bradshaw leads Stanton by six and Bale by seven. Morocco and Kidrowski round out the top five. One more item of interest from the Silverdome, check out Miss Coors. Tired of being sprayed week after week, she brought her own bottle of champagne to get a little revenge. Looks to me, though, like she's still getting the worst of the deal. You know, maybe someone should teach her the fine art of champagne dumping. Las Vegas, Nevada, the gambling capital of the world, was the site of round 13. It was also the site of a major conflict, another change in the series lead, and sadly, the final race of the Supercross season for Mike LaRocco. He crashed hard while running fifth in one of the semis. The winner of the season opener had been riding hurt and finally decided enough is enough. Yeah, he's got an injured wrist. He has a broken navicular bone. And uh, he's been trying to ride. He broke it in uh, Anaheim. He's just re-injuring it. This type of track is really hard on it. So uh, he's going to just withdraw from the rest of Supercross for the, from here out. A sad end to a great start and what might have been a great season. Remember the bradshaw Matasevich conflict in Atlanta? Well, they got together again in Las Vegas. Now, this is the second heat race of the night. Matasevich is out front, Bradshaw close behind. Now, smart money dictates this is not the place for a shoving match. But when Bradshaw's behind Matasevich or vice versa, smart money goes out the window. These two guys started ramming each other as amateurs and just plain don't get along. You have to wonder if anyone other than Matasevich had been in front of Bradshaw, would Bradshaw have pushed quite so hard? Into a left-hand sweeper, Matasevich bobbles, Bradshaw nowhere to go. No harm and certainly no foul. In fact, after the race, both riders agreed it was just one of those things that happened in racing. Yeah, I sort of slid out and I think Damon was trying to go underneath me or something. Uh, he got caught up in my rear wheel and went down. I had the inside and I was in the position I wanted to be, but uh, you know, when he broke loose, there was not really anywhere for me to go. I tried to get out of it, but uh, you know, there was no way I went down and uh, got back up and you know, qualified. You know, that's probably the first time either of them has agreed with the other. This is the main event close to the midway point. Bale was the leader, followed by Stanton, who in turn was followed by Matasevich, and in fourth place, Damon Bradshaw. The track was tight and slippery. Now, that meant passing was tough. All agreed if you saw a hole or had a chance, take it. Bradshaw would later say that's exactly what he was doing. Coming up, a tight hairpin turn. Matasevich will go high and Bradshaw will go, well, watch and see. For his part in the incident, Bradshaw would later be fined by the AMA for riding in a manner that endangered other riders. You decide, was it a takeout move or was Bradshaw looking for a block pass and lost control? Back to the race where Bale had the win all but locked up. 
Stanton would make an all-out effort in the closing laps, but at the checkered flag, would settle for second. Mike Kudrowski, for the second consecutive week, turned in another great ride to finish third. Rounding out the top five were Guy Cooper and Larry Ward. Just after the checkered flag, the fun really began. Yeah, I want I want something done done about it. I think it's it's not uh it's not right. You know, we tangled in the qualifier, and he went down. But but that was racing, and, and you're gonna crash racing. But a deliberate takeout, uh, it's not necessary. I don't know if he was out there thinking it was gonna be a payback from the qualifier or whatever. But um, you know, it's just pretty stupid. Damon, meanwhile, attributed the move to the difficulty in passing and the pressure he felt to get around Matasevic before his championship rivals got away. Well, you know, when the tracks are the way they are, uh, you have to, you know, you have to try things like I did. Um, if I wouldn't have felt like I could have won the race, I might not have tried to take that chance. Um, I was a little bit faster through that section than Chicken was, so I, I tried to go on the inside. I knew there was going to be some banging going on, but, you know, the, the pass just didn't work for me. It's one of those things, and uh, I had to take the chance. Like I said, if I didn't feel like I could have won, I would have stayed there and waited for his mistake, but I didn't have time. You know, I needed to get behind those guys and start figuring out those lines and uh, because I need to win races. Meanwhile, Damon's team manager was raising money for a protest against the Hondas. We believe the bikes to be illegal and not to meet the AMA rules, and uh, the only way to really check it out is to file the protest and uh, let the AMA do the measuring and uh, see how it works out. While the winning bikes were impounded, the frames and swing arms measured, Honda's team manager thought the whole thing was sour grapes. Well, I think it's, uh, we're in a situation where Honda wasn't very competitive at the beginning of the year, and now we end up... Um, you know, getting back in the points chase and getting a lead, and I think everybody's getting a little tense. And I just think it's a attempt from Yamaha trying to uh, take a stab at Honda to see if there is anything in question. I don't really think there's any. Well, from our side, we don't have anything to hide. We race production motorcycles. We abide by the rules, and we're we're uh, abiding by the AMA request to tear the bikes down, let them question the parts. As we get set for round 14 in Dallas, here's the upshot of it all. Bradshaw was handed a heavy fine. The AMA measured the frames and determined they were legal. The bottom line, Bradshaw's pocket is lighter. Bale leads the series by two over Stanton and six over Bradshaw. As the gate drops on round 14, note the condition of the track. It's been raining here in Dallas, and that means a little bit of mud and a whole lot of slippery. First corner, Guy Cooper is the first victim. Ron Tishner joins him. We'll not see those two the rest of the night, but they turned in great rides. Cooper ended up seventh and Tishner 12th. Damon Bradshaw was the fastest out of the gate, followed by Jeff Ward. Ward, who was scheduled for shoulder surgery within a couple of weeks of the Dallas event, was riding hurt. He did Bale was in second place. Stanton did not fare well at all in the Dallas mud. He was caught up in traffic somewhere around the middle of the pack, and with the mud flying, that's not the place to be if you're in the championship chase. Back in fourth and fifth, Kawasaki teammates Jeff Matasevic and Mike Kudrowski were battling each other. Both riders in the last few races had come on strong and recorded excellent finishes. You have to wonder if they had ridden that well at the beginning of the season, if the points race might now be different. Speaking of the points race, at the front of the pack, you're about to see another shakeup. Bradshaw falls victim to the slippery track. Bale inherits the lead, and the question becomes, can Bradshaw run him down? Prior to the fall, the two riders seem to be riding at just about the same speed. The next 16 laps would tell if either of them had a little extra in reserve. Stanton, meanwhile, did not appear to be riding aggressively. In seventh place, he seemed content to pass riders when the opportunity presented, rather than forcing the pass like you might expect. Whatever his strategy was, it was taking him nowhere fast. In mechanics row, fast did not appear to be a problem. Brian Lunas, Bradshaw's mechanic, was pleased with the pace and not at all concerned that Bradshaw was in second place. The Yamaha rider had closed the gap on Bale, but was still three seconds or so behind, and time was running out. Perhaps Lunas had a crystal ball, and knew Bale was about to make a major league error. Watch this. Bale was completely off the bike. By all rights, he should have crashed and crashed hard. Watch it again. To hold on and to save it, 
That was quite simply a remarkable piece of riding. It did knock the wind out of his sails, so when Bradshaw caught Bale, there was not much of a fight. Bale said, go ahead, it's yours. Let's get this thing over. He had to be a herd puppy. At the checkered flag, Bradshaw had moved three points closer to the title. Bale, who held on to finish second, retained the points lead. It was a mere three over Bradshaw and six over Stanton. Kidrowski, for the second week in a row, picked up third place points. Stanton managed a fourth, and Larry Ward was fifth. For Bradshaw, eight wins in a single season. That tied the record set by Bale one year ago. After 14 events, the series would be decided in the final two rounds. At Spartan Stadium, San Jose, California, site of round 15, the pressure was on. Listen to the riders' thoughts as race action gets underway. I have less pressure than last year. I feel a lot better, and I feel like, you know, it's just, I just have to do it, but, you know, it's not something, you know, very important for me, so I feel, I feel better to do it. The pressure's definitely tough, but I'm just going in, and, hey, I'm going to do the best I can and try to win this race. And that's what it's going to have to be from here on out. You're just going to have to try to win races. You're not going to be able to accept second or third. For me, it's just a, just another race. Uh, there's other guys that haven't won championships, so I would say they have more pressure than I do. So I'm just going out there to, to do my job and to, to do it the best of my ability. Well, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on, uh, on everybody on the team. They, they don't want to make a mistake and, uh, you know, trying to think of the things that are important to the race to try to win the race. Um, you know, it's just a, it's a great deal of pressure, I think, for everybody on the team. Racing is always looked at underneath the microscope anyways, because it is a luxury. So uh, it doesn't really add pressure that, oh, you're leading a championship and the weight of Yamaha worldwide is on your back. No, it's not that at all. It's, uh, it's just one of those things, and uh, they'd be really happy if we won. But if we didn't, we've really made a mark. Look at the bike maybe a little bit more closely, but on the starting line, I also just give it a once over. And uh, I, I'm, I try to work a little more with Jeff, you know. I, I try to get him make sure his head's screwed on straight because I feel that's a lot more important uh, than uh, worrying about if a nut's going to fall off the motorcycle. You know, a mechanic works a dual role. He has to make sure the bike's working, but he also has to make sure his rider's head's screwed on straight. Now, if you believe those that claim no pressure, call me. I have a bridge for sale. Stanton, Matasevich, and Bale with a little daylight between them. A few corners later, it looked like this. The daylight was gone, and it was all-out warfare. Stanton went wide. Matasevich cut to the inside. Bale knew a good thing when he saw it. He followed Matasevich through the wide open hole. Three abreast, and something had to give. That something was Bale. He shot off the track and went shoulder first into a hay bale. Bale's quest for a second straight championship was as good as over. Testing the shoulder he had jammed into the hay bale, Jean-Michel returned to the track. You can only imagine his thoughts. A long season that started slow, gathered speed, and just a few seconds earlier, a championship in his grasp. Watch again. Was there contact with Stanton, or was it a riding error on the part of Bale? Either way, Bale was out of control when he landed. The soft sand was unpredictable, and efforts on the part of Bale to regain control of his Honda were useless. Bale would finish ninth in the San Jose Supercross. Mathematically, he still had a chance. Realistically, it was over. What was not over, though, was the fight for the lead. Every attempt by Stanton was foiled by Matasevich. Stanton knew, though, that if he did not make a move, Bradshaw would. Watch the block pass in this corner. Stanton got by Matasevich, but Bradshaw passed them both. From another angle, Stanton simply lost his momentum and at the same time left a huge hole for Bradshaw. He tried to cut across the track to block Bradshaw, but was too late. All Stanton could do was follow and hope for a Bradshaw mistake. Instead, it was Kidrowski that made the mistake. He picked himself up to finish 14th. Number 59, Mike Craig, was not as lucky. He suffered a broken nose. Bradshaw took the win and a six-point advantage in the series standings over Stanton. Stanton finished second. Doug Dubach, Bradshaw's Yamaha teammate, finished third. The crash that claimed Craig and Kudrowski also knocked Matasevich out of the race. He suffered no injuries. In the Honda pits, everyone gathered to look at video of Bale's crash. Naturally, the two riders involved had different viewpoints. I already passed Stanton in the turn, so I was thinking he was behind, and he just tried to pass me back on the jump. And... You know, you, would you say that it was intentional by any means, or it was just racing? Oh, that's racing. You know, he's always racing. But, you know, I think, you know, when, when you're in a, you know, in a team, you try not to race too much with, a, with, your, with your friend. 
but we race a little bit too much, so we lose the championship. So there was no contact. We just watched the video. So I mean, he can say what we want. We have it on. We have it on TV. So he basically was out of control. So I mean, uh, what he says, he says that he thought that you came in and clipped his back wheel a little bit just before he got to the sandpit or coming out exiting the the berm, and he was a little bit sideways or something when he when he went off the first little set of hoops. That's a good excuse for him to uh, get out of just you know a simple little crash. So. Like I said, I didn't hit him. No contact. No contact. And Bradshaw wheelies to the famed L.A. Coliseum with a six-point margin. If Stanton were to win the series finale, Bradshaw, with a third-place finish, would clinch the crown. Those that watched Bradshaw throughout the season knew that the talented rider could do that with a flat tire and a passenger on the back. There was no question regarding the outcome of the championship chase. The question was... Would Bradshaw go for all the gold in victory number 10, or would he play it cool and settle for third? Despite Stanton's claim of no pressure, he rode poorly in his heat race. Here in third place, with Bale chasing him, Stanton crashed. Bale ran into him, and they were both out of contention. Add that to the San Jose feud. Now catch Bale's crash after the heat in the pits. Do you suppose Bale thought Stanton crashed on purpose? The two Honda riders were paired in a semifinal where they raced as if it were the championship main event. Bale went on to claim the win, and when asked why he was racing his teammates so hard, he said, if Stanton wants to be champion, he has to ride like a champion. He has to earn it. Somewhere after the semifinal and before the main event, perhaps with Bale's words stoking his fire, Stanton woke up. He put his Honda in front and would keep it there until the checkered flag. It was now up to Bradshaw. The running order? Stanton, Cooper, Kedrowski, Bradshaw, and Bale. Bradshaw needed to pass a single rider. On lap seven of the 20-lap main event, Kedrowski passed Cooper. Bradshaw had passed no one and was still one position away from the crown. His followers knew it was just a matter of time. They knew Bradshaw was playing it safe and looking for a Cooper mistake. And if the mistake was not forthcoming, then soon, very soon, Bradshaw would pick up the pace and in one magical pass would blow by the Suzuki star. Bale, meanwhile, made no effort to pass Bradshaw. He could help his teammates' cause, but it was obvious from the start he had no intention of doing that. His earlier words echoed, if Stanton wants to be champion, he must ride like a champion. And in Bale's mind, he had to do it himself. Then Cooper began pulling away. It was apparent now, as it should have been earlier, that Bradshaw was struggling. It was apparent now there would be no championship for the 19-year-old rider that had won a record-setting nine events. In the closing stages of the race, Jeff Emig drew to within striking distance of Bale. Bale responded by passing Bradshaw with ease and pulling away. The conclusion of the 1992 AMA Supercross Series was just one checkered flag away. Jeff Stanton would take that checkered flag and join Bob Hanna as the only riders to have ever won three Supercross crowns. On the finish line jump, Stanton's first reaction must have been one of disbelief. Then it sunk in. He was joined by his mechanic, Dan Bentley. It's hard to tell who was the happiest. The emotions in the Yamaha pits were predictable. Bradshaw had every reason to avoid the inevitable questions he knew would be asked. But Bradshaw faced the fans and reporters like he had faced the challenge of the season. I could tell I ran myself in the ground. I just was way too tight. And, uh, you know, I think I was concentrating way too hard. I didn't ride my race and couldn't put anything together. I kept putting things together and then something would happen. I'd make a mistake and it was like I was fighting a losing battle. But, uh, you know, no excuses. Still a great year. Yeah, it has been. It's been a good year. You know, I was able to win nine races, and uh, you know, I don't know what I ended up in the series, but whatever I did, I didn't win. So. You mentioned before that if something like this happened, uh, you wish you had a race tomorrow to, to make up for it. Well, yeah, I do. It's been a long year. You know, it hasn't been easy. It's been tough. Um, every race has been tough, and I'm just going to deal with it and go on. I'll be back next year. For Jeff Stanton, what can you say? He was the champion of the most difficult season of Supercross in the history of the sport. I mean, it's the happiest moment of my life. Last two weeks, I've been thinking about this, going through my head. And, uh, man, it, just, it couldn't have worked any better. I'm, I'm so happy. Pain, turmoil, anger, 
excitement, they all came together. It was Supercross 92, a season of thrills. Thank <laughs> you. 